Unbelief is a thief. It robs us of God's rest and God's best. Unbelief makes us miss out on what could have been, what would have been, what should have been, if only we had walked by faith. And so unbelief is a thief, a burglar of blessings. And Numbers 13 and 14, I believe, describe one of the biggest burglaries in all of human history because the people of God had the promises of God snatched right out from under them in a moment. You see, the thief of unbelief kept the Israelites out of the land of Canaan, out of the promised land, for 40 long years. Years. Now, I am 40 this year, and I know 40 is a long time. That's a long time. My entire life is how long they spent out there in the wilderness. And the Bible is full of physical stories with spiritual significance. And so whenever you see the promised land, in a way it should bring your mind back to the promised life. The promised land, the promised life. And if you've been here for any length of time, you know that our church verse is John 10.10. 10. John 10.10, 10, and it's the words of Jesus, and he said, I have come that you might have life and life to the full. And so that's the promised life. It's not just eternal life somewhere out there, but heaven, a little foretaste of heaven that starts right now and continues on for all eternity. A faithful life, a fruitful life. And so for every New Testament principle, there is an Old Testament picture. And in the Old Testament, God painted what I believe is just a perfect picture of redemption into the very history of his people. There are three main places that we will see as we study tonight in Numbers 13 and 14. The first, Egypt. The second, the wilderness. And the third, Canaan. Now, just to make sure that it's crystal clear in everybody's mind, Egypt... Well, it's nothing against the people of Egypt specifically if you have that background, but here's the point. In the scripture, what we see there is that is a picture of life without God, of lostness, of hopelessness, of helplessness. They were slaves, the people of God were there in Egypt under cruel masters. And so we see the book of Exodus was the exit out of Egypt. And that was a couple of books back. But now you see them still wandering in the second spot, which is the wilderness. And I call that the miserable middle. That's where we kind of find the folks in Numbers 13. Out of Egypt, yes, but not yet into Canaan. And they were, as you look at that picture of redemption, saved. Yes, they came to that point during the Passover way back in Egypt. But they're not yet living a faithful, fruitful life. They're still missing out on God's rest and God's best. And that is found there in the third spot that we look at tonight, which is Canaan, the promised land. Now, it's important for you not to get confused about Canaan. A lot of people think it's a picture of heaven. If you listen to some old hymns or some of the old gospel songs, they often spoke of when I die someday I'll cross over into Canaan. You know, and they'll have that kind of crossing over into Canaan when I die, you know, kind of thing. And you go, wait, that's great music maybe. Not the way I did it, but it's great music the way they did it, but not good theology. See, Canaan isn't heaven. How do we know that? Because if you read ahead to the book of Joshua, they had plenty of problems still in the promised land, enemies and battles and all the rest. That's not heaven. But what it was was God's best for them. And you see that they even experienced God's rest in that land after a time. And so this was the place of God's best and God's rest. Now, what kept them out of Canaan for so long? Well, it's one word that we'll come in contact over and over with tonight. Unbelief. Unbelief. One word. In Numbers 13, the Israelites were at the very border of blessing in their life. But instead of walking forward in faith, what they did is they fell back in fear. And they let the thief of unbelief rob them blind. Now, that's bad news for them, but it's great news for us. Why do I say that? Because it's now a preventable problem in our life. See, unbelief is a thief, but the thief of unbelief can only rip you off if you let him. That's the bottom line. Ultimately, the only person who can keep me out of Canaan is me because God's promises to all of us are, that's where I'm taking you. That's where I want you. That's where you can be. The only person who can keep you out of the promised life is you. Now, as you see in verse 1 of Chapter 13 in Numbers, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving you to the children of Israel. 
From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a teacher, every one a leader among them. Now, you need to know right up there, right up front, that the sending of the spies was not really an act of faith so much as it was an act of doubt. Now, you might say right away, wait a minute. I read it right there in verse 1. God commanded them to do it. Yes, that's true. But it's important to look at the whole counsel of God. And a quick cross-reference for you to write in your Bible is Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21. Deuteronomy 1, verse 21. I just spell it D-E-U-T because it's too hard to write Deuteronomy. But what you'll see is that in Deuteronomy 1, Moses reports what he said just prior to what happened here in chapter 13 of Numbers. See, Deuteronomy 121, I'll read it for you. It's Moses giving this pep talk, and he says, Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. They were right there on the border of it. And he says, Now go up and possess it as the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. And then you see in verse 22 something so important. It says, And every one of you came near to me and said, Let us send a man before us. Let us send men before us. And let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us by the way we should go up and uh, the cities that we shall come to. And it says in verse 23 something really important. Moses comments on it, lest you think he's just blaming the people. He said, Hey, the plan pleased me really well. So I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe. Now, what do we see here in Deuteronomy 1 that helps us understand Numbers 13. It's this, that the plan to send the spies was originated in the mind of man, not in the heart of God. You see there that the plan of man was what? Let's analyze. Let's investigate. Let's decide how and even if we should really do it. And Moses even admits, hey, the plan pleased me well enough. That's why I went along with it. But it didn't particularly please God, as we will see. Why? Because God could see what the outcome of this would be. And returning to Numbers 13, we know now that God's command to spy out the land and send those spies was really God just allowing his people to do things their way rather than his way. It's known as the permissive will of God. And it's something we should get familiar with. We will tonight. You look at three P's really when it comes to the will of God. You might want to write these down. The first one is perfect will, the perfect will of God. That's where you want to be. That's Canaan, really. And then you see the permissive will of God. That's going to be something where God says, well, I'll allow it, but it's really not the best. And then you see also his preventive will, his preventive will. There's sometimes God just says, no, no way is this going to happen. It's going to happen my way no matter what anybody says. And so you see the perfect will you see the permissive will, you see the preventive will. And every parent has these three, right? If you're a parent, you should. And perfect will, what's that? That's what you know to be the right choice. Then you have your permissive will, which is you're not going to make every single choice for your child. You're going to let them make some decisions. And then you're going to have preventive will. What is that? That's going to be something that I don't care how many please, 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 please is there, there are. You're not going to do it. You're not going to bend. You're not going to move. And so as our kids get older, one of the things that we do is we allow more and more things to be their choice with their consequence. And an example, maybe, it happens all the time for us. One of the kids comes to me and says, Dad, I want to buy this. Okay, they hold up something, I want to buy this with my birthday money. Okay, that's what they have at our house. The richest people are the kids. Why? Because they have birthday money, right? They have Christmas money. They have all these things. And so we have it, though, in our account, but we still have it marked as theirs. So they come and they say, please, 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 please. And I'll say, look, that's a piece of junk. It's going to break just like the last birthday thing. That that's a waste of your money. I don't, why don't you do this with your money instead? But, Dad, I want to waste my money on this bad toy that's so overpriced and it's going to break before the end of the day. I've already heard your speech. I know, but I want it. So, all right. All right, go ahead. It's your money. It's your choice. And my hope in that is not that the toy's going to break, not that they're going to have bad consequences, but that they're eventually going to make good choices, that even when I'm not there to tell them what to do, they'll still make a good choice. And someday they'll say the same thing to their kids, just like my parents said to me. You know that cycle. And so this is really huge, right? God has given us freedom of choice, but not freedom from consequences. That's massive if we understand it. Freedom of choice but not freedom from consequence. And sometimes God will allow us to do things in his permissive will, even though he knows it's not the best route. It's not the best choice. Now, his word gives us the best choice, and it also gives us the consequences of the other choices. 
And see, that was the case with Canaan. He had already said, this is my best for you. This is what I want for you. And there's really no need to send spies for them. Why? God had already spied out the land. He had already given them all of the information they needed. He had promised Canaan to Abraham and the kids all the way back in Genesis. I mean, this is a promise that it's impossible to miss. And he even repeats the same promise again in verse 1 in case they miss it. He goes, all right, all right, if that's the way you want it, send spies to the land I'm giving you, like they needed to hear it one more time. And so the whole reason that God ever brought them out of Egypt in the first place wasn't so that they would wander in the wilderness. No, it was so that they would enjoy the promised life in the promised land. And so God had led them every step of the way this far, right? Even in the wilderness. And you see also that he had told them exactly what the land would be like. He said it's flowing with milk and honey. Now, right away, some of us would say, ooh, sounds sticky. I don't know if I'd want to go to a land with milk and honey. But that is a Hebrew way of saying abundance. Everything good and sweet and wonderful there. And yet what you see is in Numbers 13.22, if you just glance down at that verse, it says that their very reason for sending spies, verse 22, was to pick a path for themselves and to see also, hey, is it really as good as God has said? Is it really all that he said it was? And so right away, again, I just want to lay this foundation as we look throughout the chapter that man's plan was the very first step toward unbelief. It really wasn't outright disobedience yet, no, because God was allowing it and all the rest, but you see, it's just the first step, and that's how it happens so often in our life. Not one fall all at once, but something where we just start going down the wrong path. And you've maybe done this in your life. I know I have. Well, we've heard what God said, but let's see what the experts say. Let's strategize. Let's analyze. Now, some would say, what does this mean, Scott, that we can't use our brain, that we've got to check it at the door? No, if you did, please pick it up on the way out. But here's the thing. It's okay to use wisdom in light of the word, of course. But you know what? We need to get very honest with things and, and ask ourselves, you know what? Have I put a lot more trust in my life in the plans of man than I have in the promises of God? What am I doing right now? Am I trusting in the word of people or the uh, promises of people or being disappointed at the promises of people? Or am I really putting my trust where it belongs in the promises of God? Because as we will soon see, fact-finding can lead to faith losing if we're not careful. Not because our faith is not built on facts, but because we tend to act on the facts so often and say, well, that's what I'm going to look at. That's what I'm going to pay attention to. And yet what happened in their life is they saw the facts, but they lost the faith. And they all saw the same facts, but some still kept the faith even in light of those facts. And so what are you seeing there? Well, what started out as a mission from God, and that was a good thing, ended up in their minds mission impossible as their faith turn to fear. And so if you don't already know it, you will, and you'll find it out as we're going along in this life. You know, every single opportunity comes with opposition, with obstacles. Of course it does. And sometimes the more we find out about those obstacles, the more we see them, the bigger they become, and the smaller the opportunity looks that God has given us. And again, most Thieves are sneaky, you know. They don't just waltz right in the front door and break it down. No, they come in quietly, and that's exactly what happened. The thief of unbelief snuck in through what seemed like a very reasonable request. Hey, why don't we just send spies? We'll go soon enough, but let's do a little investigative journalism. And so you see in verse 4, these are the names. Now, I'm not going to read those names because we're already seeing there's a lot to cover in this chapter. And So I'll just summarize it this way. There were 10 names that no one remembers and two names that I hope you will never forget. The first is found in verse 6, that's Caleb. And the second is found in verse 8, that's Hosea, which you can write next to that, Joshua. Joshua is the more common name that we understand with that, but it's the same guy. So Caleb and Joshua. Now, if you want to know how to leave a legacy in your life, live it by faith. You want to know how to be forgotten by history? Live it in doubt. See, I doubt very seriously that there are any Shamuas here tonight. You know, if you are, well, I'm sorry that your parents named you that. But Shamua, well, but I bet there might be a Caleb or a Joshua here. Why? Because those are the names that are remembered. Those are the people that we want to pattern our lives after. We named the, uh, you know, the killer whale Shamu, but that's different. And so you see 12 
spies total, right? But only two of them really left a legacy of faith. All of them leaders. All of them had people who would pick them and say, yeah, that's a guy who could go somewhere. That's someone who we would want to send to do some fact-finding. And they're all influencing others. But here's the thing. Ten led the people to run away in fear, and two of them led the people in faith. They called others to take the same path they were ready to take. And everyone had the same facts, but not everyone had the same faith. And you'll always find that to be true in life. And a couple of questions for us to ask ourselves in the Holy Spirit is this. Who am I most like? Am I most like the ten or am I most like the two? And who am I most likely to pattern my life after? The ten or the two? Well, as you think about that, we can just pick it up there at verse 27. And you see the spies return after 40 days with proof in their hand of God's promises. In verse 27, this is what it says. It says, they told Moses and said, we went to the land where you sent us, and it truly flows with milk and honey. And here it is. This is the fruit. Now, maybe you've seen the symbol of the tourism board in Israel. It is two guys carrying grapes so big on a pole that it takes two guys to carry it. And this is a reference to this right here. And so you're seeing right here that things could have been so different than they were. Things could have forked in the road right here in the direction of faith instead of fear. And maybe there's some people here in this room right now who face one of those forks in your road right now. Maybe we can learn the lessons here from their example. It says there that, that they all came back saying, hey, this is the fruit. And if all 12 had been faithful instead of 10 being fearful... You know what? They could have brought lots of information back that would have been helpful. They could have brought confirmation back that God's promises were proved. And the spies saw the fruit there. They had it in their hand. They saw it with their own eyes. And they even brought some of the blessings back. You can picture them with big old milk mustaches, you know? The land flowing with milk and honey. So, hey, got milk? Yeah, they got milk. Hands all sticky from the honey. Anyone got a little wipe or something? Man, we got it. Great ga grapes there, you know, from the grape ape. And you got big figs, the big fig Newton. Do you remember that one? They had all that stuff. They probably packed on a few pounds. They hadn't been gone but 40 days, but they had a lot of pomegranate pies, it says. You know, and so there they are going, hey, everything's bigger. We're even bigger. Everything's bigger and better than we imagined in the promised life. And yeah, it's true, the giants are pretty big there. But you know what? God is a lot bigger than any giant. And, you know, so let's pack it in tight and let's go. Any of you who have been around the youth know what I'm talking about. <laughs> pack it in tight. Thanks to Jose for that one. But you see, unfortunately, they didn't just bring back physical fruit. They brought back spiritual fruit. Unfortunately, rotten spiritual fruit. They brought back with them the thief of unbelief. You see that in verse 28. Again, one of these words that's so important in the Bible. It says, nevertheless. I put that in huge font in my notes here so I would look at it and I circled it in my Bible at home. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large and moreover we saw the descendants of Anak there and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. And it's just terrible. So you see there, nevertheless, that one word, it changed everything. It just brought their belief to a screeching halt and the blessings with it. And again, a searching question to ask myself, to ask yourself is this. Am I a nevertheless Christian? Am I a nevertheless kind of person? Oh, I know God's promised us great things, but nevertheless, not my marriage. I know God's promised some great things into the life of believers, but hey, not in my life, not in my ministry, not in my area. Nevertheless, see, my problems are too great, my background is too bad, or whatever else. My failures loom too large. And so, nevertheless, what does it mean? It means that we will always settle for less. If that's the kind of life we live, a nevertheless life, we'll have less life than God intended us to have, less than God ever promised to us, less than God's rest, less than God's best. And not only this, not only will we have less of it in our own life, but we'll give less of it to the lives of others. You see that everyone who listens to us and follows in our footsteps of fear instead of our footsteps of faith will be affected by it. And so you see in verse 28, it says, moreover, moreover, <laughs> nevertheless, moreover, 
a long list of enemy armies here. And you can just picture the people of Israel kind of shrinking and slumping with each name. Amalekites. Ugh. Hittites. Eh. Jebusites. Oh. Amorites. Canaanites. Termites. Gigabytes. And so as we'll see, you know, Caleb and Joshua, they even admitted, you know what? Yeah, the foes are big, but so's the fruit. They're bigger than we are, that's true, but they're not bigger than God is. And without God, we will fail. That's an okay place to be in life. But with God, we cannot lose. And so faith is not just ignoring the facts, but faith factors in the most important factor into every equation, which is the God factor. And that's what you see the two doing and the ten not doing. And so verse 30, it says, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Again, little words in the Bible can mean so much. Circle the word we if you think about it there. It's the ten spies making the wrong comparison. For the ten there, the thief of unbelief had a hold of their hearts, and he'd taken God, ta taken God totally out of the picture for them. And verse 31, you see it there with that. He, they are stronger than we. But that was never what God said the battle would be about anyway. And Joshua and Caleb, yeah, they saw that they were stronger than we, but not stronger than God not stronger than the big God that they have. And that shrunk the giants right back down to their proper perspective. You see, this is the way I like to put it. When you focus on the problems, God looks very small. When you focus on God, problems suddenly look very small. It's all a matter of perspective. And so it's so important to look at where our faith focus is or our fear focus because fear focus is on the problem. Faith focus on the God who said, I have promised to take care of these things for you. Now, if you think about it, I remember this one from school. The bigger they come, sometimes the harder they fall. Think about it. They said these giants were 10 to 12 feet tall, but guess what? That means, man, you can kick them right in the knee. Bang! You know, kick a guy in the knee, he bends over, you poke him in the eye. You know, and he, while he's trying to figure that out, smack him in the top of the head, all these kind of things, and you realize, hey, giants, yeah, they can fall too, and they can fall big time. And so the solution is that we need to see the obstacles in our life, the enemies in our life. I'm not talking about a physical fight here. The Bible says that we fight in the spiritual realm. But what we need to do is learn to see our enemies as God sees them, which is already defeated, already gone. And you need to learn to see yourself as God sees you, which the Bible says we're more than conquerors in Christ. So we've got a conquered enemy, and we are more than conquerors in Christ. What a great way that is to go through life. And so you see unbelief as a terrible thief. It steals the most valuable things that God gives us. What are the valuables that God gives us? Joy, peace, faith, hope, love, all of those things. And maybe you know what it is to have those things stolen out of your life by unbelief. And you know what, if you've ever had something stolen, you know it's not a pleasant process. Now, the other day that uh, we were here, Saturday night service, it happened to be uh, the week of my wife's birthday. And so after the Saturday night service, uh, I took her to the crack house. Now, some of you are saying, that doesn't sound like a nice place. <laughs> the crack house. Well, I, it's, you may know it by another name. It's the Cracker Barrel. Uh, I call it the crack house, you know, but the Cracker Barrel, it's that restaurant that's half store and half restaurant and all uh, expensive and all bad for you and all that kind of stuff. But it's very addictive, and that's why I call it the crack house. And it just opened down in, in Homestead and probably kill you just as fast. But what you see there is, is midway through the meal, we were sitting there and, and we were out with our, our in-laws and sometimes my in-laws can be outlaws and they're here tonight and I just <laughs> want to say that sometimes they do this. But midway through the meal, you know, Carissa couldn't contain herself any longer. It was one of those moments where a kid's trying to get some of their birthday money kind of thing. And so she goes, Daddy, I want to go over to the store. I, there's something you have to see. And it was a little puppy that would like lick, uh, you know, into a bowl. And that was the thing, this motorized puppy. And I knew, yeah, you spend $40 on it, it'll be broken in a day. But I decided, yeah, I'll go over and see. I'll see if my permissive will will permit it, you know. And so we went over, and, 
At this point, I had only eaten about half of my chicken fried steak, you know, just as a, and I, and I had still a mountain of mashed potatoes and some other things. So I took a little intermission from the, from the dinner there. And, I, and before I left, I gave some strict orders because I was worried that something might happen to my food. And so I said, hey, don't let the waitress or the busboy or anybody come in and clear these dishes. I am not done. There's still plenty of food here. There's at least another meal here and all the rest. So, and, and by the way, don't borrow any bites. I know how much food I got. And before I left, I, I even threatened to take a picture with my cell phone camera of my plate to make sure everything was in the proper place. But as an act of trust, I showed my family that I did trust them. And I came back a couple minutes later. And what did I find? Well, you probably already know. An empty plate there at my spot. You know, and it had not exactly empty. It had one kernel of corn sitting there, one little bit. <laughs> and a little partial piece kind of with a bite out of it is some fried okra, which I think belonged to my father-in-law, I'm not sure. And then a little spot of gravy, just enough to let it know that it had been there. And then some little biscuit crumbs and all the rest of this. Now I looked around at this uh, bunch of guilty criminals that I call my family and I said, you know, they all maintain their innocence and I started asking the wait staff and the people sitting around and everything. And finally, one of the kids cracked under the interrogation pressure. You know, I brought out the little interrogation kit. No, I didn't do that. But, you know, and they produced my plate in perfect order with all of the food, I think, still exactly the way I had left it. Now, that night it brought lots of laughter. But here's the thing. The thief of unbelief, when he steals, he doesn't always bring it back. And that's the case that we see here in the Folks, as we go into chapter 14, it's such a sad transition here. You see all of the congregation lifting up their voice and crying at this point. And the people wept that night. And the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only, I don't know if you've ever said, If only we died in the land of Egypt. If only we died in the wilderness. Why? There's another good one. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fail, fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not have been better for us just to return to Egypt? And someone said, yeah, that's a good idea. So they say to each other, let's select a leader who will lead us back to Egypt. That was a great spot. And so you see, unbelief is a thief and a liar too. And here they, what did they lose? Well, they lost so much. But first, they lost a night of sleep. Have you ever lost one of those? Lost a, light of, a, a night of sleep. Mourning a loss that hadn't even happened yet. In fact, it wouldn't have happened if they hadn't had so much fear and they'd had a little faith. And they were so afraid of their enemies at this point, shaken in their sandals. But the truth is, they were their own worst enemy. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. I can tell you, in my life, I have been my own worst enemy time and time and time and time again. And they did it right here. They lived a life of self-made misery. They were so afraid of dying, they never really lived. And you see in verse 3, what a crazy idea it hatched. Let's go back to Egypt. Remember, they're on the far side of the wilderness by this point, a wilderness that they only made it across because God was with them and provided for them miraculously. Every three days they were saying, where's the water? So now they're going to say, okay, we'll go back. And the thief of unbelief, one of the things that it does in our life is it makes retreating in fear look safer than going forward in faith. And the exact opposite is true. Think about the statement. Hey, it's best to go back. Back to Egypt? Well, they even knew in here that Moses would never go that way. They said, let's get a new leader. This guy wants to lead us forward in faith. Let's find somebody who will lead us backward in fear. I, I know we can do that. Let's vote in a new guy. And, you know, here's the thing. You can easily find in your life, there's a whole host of them. You can easily find plenty of people willing to lead you backwards in unbelief and disobedience and complaining and all the rest of that. It's easy to find folks like that. But your real friends, if you have them in your life, and the real friend that you want to be is the kind of person who will call people forward into a walk of faith that you're taking yourself. 
Somebody who will call you into faithful obedience, even if it's a little difficult at the moment. And you see in verse 5 that Moses and Aaron, that's the kind of people they were. You see them falling on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And you see Joshua here, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of some guy that's harder to say than Nun. And those who were among those who had spied out the land and they tore their clothes. This was a sign of great grief in that culture. Now, if I had been Moses or I'd been Aaron or one of these guys, you know, I would have been tempted not to fall on my face, but to fall on their face, you know, on the 10 spies face. That's what I would have wanted to do. Get them in a headlock, you know, and get maybe Joshua and Caleb to show me some of the spy moves that they had, you know, some of the cool things that they had learned and some of the tricks they had and the karate chops and all that kind of stuff. But instead of that, they fell on their own faces. Instead of giving them the atomic knee drop, no, they dropped to their knees. And you see them, they're wrestling in prayer for them. You see them pleading with the people. You see it in verse 7. It says they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel saying, look, the land we passed through to spy out, it's exceedingly good. If the Lord delights in us, and obviously he did, or he wouldn't have brought them to that place, he said he will bring us into this land and give it to us just like he promised, a land which flows with milk and honey. Look, I still got it stuck to me. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Now again, that's a, a word that goes with unbelief, which is fear, the opposite of faith. The, Israel, the Israelites, they were afraid. They were fearful. They were afraid of the Canaanites. But catch this. This is so important to see. The Israelites were afraid of the Canaanites, but the Canaanites were actually more afraid of the Israelites. How do I know that? Well, if you later go look again at Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, we won't go to a specific verse, but I'm just telling you, in that section of Scripture, you know what you're going to see? Forty years later even, after a lot of time has passed, you have Rahab, one of the inhabitants there of the land, saying, man, when you guys were here even 40 years ago, we were quaking in our sandals. We were shaken in the sand. We knew what God had done to the Egyptians. Even 40 years later, they still knew it. And they said, we knew that God had promised you this land, and we knew that there was no way that promise wasn't going to come true, and we were terrified of you. Isn't that interesting? Here the Israelites were saying, oh, we can't go in there. We're scared of them. And the very people in there were going, I hope they don't come in here. We're scared of them. And you see the thief of unbelief, what did it do in the people of God? It took them 40 years of wasted time. Millions of God's people who missed out on most of their life there and actually didn't even get the victory that could have been theirs. Oh yeah, they had a saved soul maybe, but a wasted life. And that's a pretty sad statement. So instead of the promised land, what'd they get? The promised sand. Lost opportunity. Unnecessary misery. All because they had their eyes on the problems instead of the promises. All because they were obsessed with the obstacles instead of the opportunities, all because they left out the God factor in every equation. And so you see in verse 10, it's pretty sad there, but there it is. It says, all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Yeah, that'll fix the problem. Hey, there's two guys who say, we can do it. Well, silence them, kill them, <laughs> hit them with stones. And we see at this point, that's like God finally said, look, I, I can't watch this anymore. I'm going to intervene directly. And you see verse 10, he steps in and he says, Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. It's like God says, I've I got a few things I want to say about this. And the Lord said to Moses, verse 11, How long will these people reject you, Moses? No, it says me. How long will they not believe me with all the signs I performed among them? I mean, God did so many miracles there. And so many times we think in our life, if I just saw more miracles, then I'd believe, hey, people haven't changed. We're no different than they were, and we've seen miracles, and we have written them off, and we have forgotten them, and we have faced a new thing and said, I know I had a whole string of really amazing things to bring me to here, but I'm sure I'm going to die here. And so verse 12, he says, I'll strike them. I'm going to strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I'll get rid of these kids, and I'll make you a whole nation greater and mightier than thee, than they were. And so God there is saying, hey, Mo, let's just start over. You and me, Mo, we're going to have the Mosites. That's what we'll call them. They'll be more better. They'll be more faithful. It's going to be great. And you see in verse 13 and verse 16, Moses has a great response too. He says, man, that is a really great offer, God. 
but I can't let you do that. I can't let you do that. It would ruin your reputation. Everybody would hear and think that you failed, and I couldn't stand for that. Now, some people have misunderstood this conversation, and they don't even see some of the scriptural humor here, but people have misunderstood this as if Moses is the really righteous one and God is the really nasty one and God needs to be sent to time out to kind of cool off and he's a real hothead and all that kind of stuff. No, we'll see throughout the scriptures that the heart of God is reflected in moments like these. He is allowing a person to portray that side of mercy. You're seeing these passages meant to uh, point out the necessity and the power of intercession. And the result of prayers that are prayed according to God's will and God's character, which is exactly what happens here. Verse 17, it's a great lesson to learn to pray according to God's word and God's will. And you see in verse 17, he says, Now I pray, this is Moses, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken. Look, he quotes God. He says, this is what you said, God, I think. I remember reading this somewhere. It says, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty. He's visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation. Now, I love that as I read it because, again, Moses is quoting God's word to God. And he says, hey, God, I don't know if you remember this little uh, thing that happened back in Exodus 33. Do you remember this whole thing where I said, hey, God, show me your glory. That would be really cool. And you said, yeah, I'll show you my glory. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass by and I'll cover you because you really couldn't stand to see me in all my glory, but I'll at least let you see a little bit. And as God crosses over and passes by, this is what Moses hears. The voice of God saying, I am the Lord, long-suffering, abundant in mercy, freely forgiving. And he goes on to say those things that we just read. But make no mistake about it, Moses. Part of my glory is that I also deal with sin seriously. I may be massively merciful, don't get me wrong, but that doesn't mean I don't deal with sin, that I'm not here to deal with that issue. And so sin will have its consequences and sometimes even lasting consequences. And so God said it and Moses says it back to God and he says, you know what, your glory is that you are the perfect balance of righteousness and forgiveness, of justice and mercy, of truth and grace, and I know you will do the right thing. And so he says, verse 19, pardon the iniquity of these people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you've forgiven these people from Egypt until now. I mean, this has been a long, ongoing process now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Now, I got to say, there's parts of the Bible I wish, well, I, I kind of liked it that the chapter stopped right there. Oh, cool, good. Everything's back. We can just go to the land like we were planning. Everything's cool. Nothing happened, right? God pardons. Everything's fine. Well, unfortunately, that's not exactly the way it goes. Look with me at verse 30. It says, except for Caleb and Joshua, none of the rest of you guys are going to enter the land that I swore that I would have you dwell in. But verse 31, he mixes mercy with justice, as he always does. And you see here, but your little ones, who you were so worried about, the ones that you used as an excuse of why you wouldn't go forward, he says, you know what? Those are the ones who are going to go in. I'll bring them in. And they shall know the land which you despised. But as for you, your carcass, carcass is such a nasty word, carcass, your carcass shall fall in the wilderness. And your son shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. Now, there's no real way to soften words like that in the Bible. And you know what? There's no reason to. The worst thing we could do is try to get rid of that kind of thing. Why? Because it's like a warning label for life. Right there, stuck on for all to see. You know what? If you let the thief of unbelief come into your life, it's not just your life that's going to get ripped off. It's quite likely that your kids are going to bear some of the brunt of your sin as you look at that. And one of the worst things about sin, as you look, I'm learning to hate sin. Are you learning to hate sin? That's what God wants us to do. I'm learning to hate what it does to my family. I'm learning to hate what it does to my loved ones. And you know what? One of the worst things about sin is that it often hurts the innocent even more than the directly guilty. Have you ever noticed that? Is it one of the problems we have? Yeah. Why do kids suffer for adult sin? Is that fair? No, but it's fact. It is the way things are. And God is just simply describing right here 
what everyone, whether they're a believer or not, knows to be true. The sin of one generation affects and infects the next generation. Now that brings up a great question because sometimes people live under a tremendous weight of guilt over this type of thing. And there's good guilt and there's bad guilt. The kind of good guilt that drives you to repentance, now that's good guilt. The bad kind of guilt that leads you to a sense of condemnation, that is not good guilt. And so it brings up a question that I've heard many times, and so I address it here. Generational curses. Anybody ever heard that? Generational curses. Anybody think they're living under one? You know, this is a false teaching in the church which says this. You are the way you are because of the way they were. You have to be this way. You don't have a choice. And you are being judged by God for somebody else's sin. There's no hope for you. You're part of the sin cycle. You're one of those three, four generations it talked about here. There's no way out for you. Well, listen, that is not true. You see what you see in verse 33 and verse 31. Look at them together. What did verse 33 say? They'll bear the brunt. That's the reality. Verse 31, I will bring them in. I'll bring them in. They'll bear the brunt. I'll bring them in. You think about that. That is an incredible biblical balance right there. Eventually, every person in every place, in every generation, will get their own opportunity to make their own choices with their own consequences. To either believe or not, and not blame the past, but to throw ourselves on the mercy of God and break the chain, maybe, of the past. And every time that you see God's glory here, the glory of His grace, One of the things about it is that sometimes the very suffering of sin and the very injustice of things calls us to cry out for the just one. Calls us to say, wait a minute, that is enough. I am not going to go down the same route as my family has gone. I am not going to go that way. By God's grace, I'm going to go the way of the cross because the cross reverses all curses. When you come to the cross, every curse is reversed. And that's what you see. Jesus became the curse for us that in him we might have freedom. And so verse 36, you see the men whom Moses went and sent to spy there in the land. They returned and they made all the congregation complain against him. So they get a whole chorus of complainers going and it says they were bringing a bad report of the land. Look what happens to them. These very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of this other guy, remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. Now, what happened here is an example for all eternity. It's not one of these things that every time somebody is a thief of unbelief or is a spokesman for the enemy, they instantly are struck dead on the spot. But here what you see is a very visible thing. Again, a picture painted of a reality, which is that with visibility comes accountability. I try to say this to people all the time in the church world. Why? Because there's something that goes with being a leader. And sometimes you see people who don't seem to understand this, that leadership is a privilege. I mean, they were picked, handpicked as leaders of the tribe, and they said, go spy out the land. And that came with a great responsibility. Not to just come back with a bunch of happy (laughs) things, but not to come back with a bad report about what God had given a good report about. Not to come back with problems when God had given promises. And so this visibility brought accountability, and God made a visible example of them to say, you know what, I want you to see where that leads. And so the thing to remember is whether we're leading a church or not, we're all leading somebody. Somebody's following you, either in faith or fear. It may be many, it may be few. But we all have responsibilities in that accountability and visibility. If somebody knows you're a Christian, then we have an accountability that goes with this. And I think it's great because what you see here is Caleb and you see Joshua. And they didn't die in the plague. They didn't just, he didn't just say, all 12 of you died because the report didn't get accepted. No. God is very able to deal out what needs to be dealt out. And it says there that they also didn't die in the wilderness. Now, they did wander in the wilderness for 40 years, but they eventually came to the promised land. And you see later Caleb saying, I'm every bit as strong now at 80 as I was at 40. Let's go in and take the land. I love it because his physical strength may be waning, but his spiritual strength wasn't. And it was God who was going to win the battle anyway. So all that Caleb could do was maybe whack him with his cane or something. But that's okay because God could do it. Trip him and that kind of stuff. Now, what does that mean for us? You know what the promises of God in some way that we don't even fully understand. You know what? Sometimes they can be delayed by the disobedience of others. 
but they will not be denied. And you see the promises come through right on God's schedule. Now you see verse 39. I'm going to read down through a fairly long section here because there's so much in this that we need to just let the Holy Spirit minister to us as we go through it. Verse 39 through the end of the chapter. So try and stick with me as I read down through it and read along in your own Bibles. You see in verse 39 it says, Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. Again, on a day that they should have been celebrating the victory that God was going to bring, they were right there on the border of blessings, and they're having a pity party. And this is what you see, verse 40. It says, They rose up early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are! We will go to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. <laughs> and the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you. You already talked about that. And you will fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord, and the Lord will not be with you. Now, he couldn't have said it much straighter than that, but then you see verse 44. It says, they presumed. You might want to circle that word. They presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, there's another nevertheless, but the wrong kind of one. Neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. And then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. Now, as we think of that, there's so many lessons in that. Unbelief is a thief. And that's at one end of the sin spectrum. I don't believe God. You know, it, it's, it's one way that we can see it real clearly. But this is something else. On the other end of the sin spectrum, there's something that kind of looks like the evil twin, the evil opposite of unbelief. It kind of looked a little bit like faith. Here we are. We're going to do it. We're sorry. We're going forward. But it says right there that it's really just a partner in crime with unbelief. And that's presumption. The people presumed. Presumed. And sometimes I wonder how much of what is called faith in life is just presumption. It's such an interesting thing because the pride pendulum here goes from unbelief, whoa, way over to the other side now, presumption. But it's just as much a sin. Unbelief is a thief, presumption's a counterfeiter. Presumption, fake faith, that's really all it is. Something pumped up in the mind of man, bravado. I can do it. God's not with you. That's okay. I'll go anyway. I'll make up for it. See, that, that statement right there should have been enough to screech anybody to a halt. God is not going with you. Whoa! I don't want to go anywhere. I'd rather wait in the wilderness for 4,000 years than try to pry my way into the promise of God when He wasn't going with me. And see, faith is only as good as its object. So important to see. So many people, they have faith, but really what they have is faith in faith. But it's faith in God that matters. Not faith in self, not faith in some presumption that somebody has. The truth is they were kind of sorry. They were sorry about the consequences. See, there's two kind of sorry. They're sorry about the consequences and sorry about the sin. And those are two radically different things. Sometimes people are sorry about the consequences. Ah! But what about sorry about the sin? See, they weren't really sorry about the sin. How do I know that? Because the subsequent, and subsequent actions demonstrated it very clearly. When God said, go, they said, no. When God said no, they said, go. And so what you see, sin is just being out of sync with God. It's not even necessary, uh, necessarily true that if somebody's wandering in the wilderness and having some trials and difficulties and challenges and feel kind of dry and all those, that doesn't even necessarily mean that they're in sin. Someone could be out there prying on the promises and say, hey, look at me. But that's out of sync with what God is doing. Sin is being out of sync with God. And so sometimes even the wilderness is the will of God for our lives. That's hard for us to understand sometimes. But the will can be, the will of God can be the wilderness for a while. Not forever. It's never God's best for somebody to stay out in the wilderness forever. But it's one of the things that only some lessons can be learned there that can never be learned anywhere else. I know in my life, I've learned some lessons that say, I don't ever want to go back here. I don't ever want to go back to this place again. I don't ever want the thief of unbelief to steal this in my life ever again, and by God's grace, it won't. And so one of the things we need to accept and know is that even forgiven sin has consequences. Sometimes 
we forget that or we want to forget it. Even forgiven sin has consequences. Now, there's eternal consequences and there's earthly consequences, and those are two different things. Forgiven sin, hey, eternal consequences, hey, I'm going to heaven, even though I'm a sinner. With a lot of forgiven sin, that's had a lot of bad consequences. But you know what? Earthly consequences can still be there. If I go rob a bank tomorrow and I really repent and I'm sorry for my sin, you know what? I still may go to jail for it, but that's better than going to hell for it. I'd rather spend a few years in jail with God. He will be there with me in the jail than eternity in hell without God. And so God will be with me in the jail or in the consequences or in the difficulties in my life, just like he promised to be with the Israelites even as they wandered in the wilderness. And he was there with them. And he did eventually get them, even the next generation, to the promised land. But there's no getting around the fact in our life that even forgiven sin, every choice we make has consequences. And real repentance comes when we're ready to accept that whatever God says is right when it comes to our wrongs. When God is, if he says, you know what, you're going to have to wander in the wilderness a little while so you can think about this and, and think about what it meant and all that. Well, okay, if you'll be with me, I'll do that. Okay, you're ready to go up into the promised land. All right, I'll only go if you're going. And so we ought to fear disobedience more than we do. <laughs> That's the bottom line. I think a lot of us fear obedience, right? <gasps> what if I obey? And what if I get in trouble? What if I lose my job? What if I lose my friends? What if I lose my mind? Well, you know what? Obedience does have consequences, even some tough ones sometimes. Some people obeyed the Lord and lost their life. But this is key. The consequences of my obedience are God's problem. And I have plenty of God's promises for, for that, my obedience. But you know what? The consequences of my disobedience, that's my problem. Now, God will be there to help me pick up the pieces after my problem. But it, you know what I'm learning? I'm learning that I'd rather face the consequences of obedience than face the consequences of disobedience, even if they look bad on both sides. You know? and, and I would rather risk death, as you see these guys doing here, risking death, fighting the giants in the land of God's promise than to die or to go back to, think I'm going back to Egypt and head back that way. No way. There's no way in that way. And so... For that matter, you know what? If you look at your life, it's better to wander in the wilderness for the entire time than it is to go one day without the presence of God and without the promise of God and without Him saying, I'm with you in this. And there is such a big difference between praying and prying and trying to do something in presumption. That's what you see here with these guys. And so we have a tragically detailed account here in these two chapters of God's people falling short. Now, why did God do that? Because he likes to point out their flaws. He likes us to see it and laugh at it or something like that. No, God did not record this event because he likes to point out their flaws. He didn't do it just to highlight a faith failure. He did it to rip the mask off the thief of unbelief so that we would be able to see it for what it is for the rest of our lives. And 1 Corinthians 10, 11 is such an important cross-reference to this. If you write it there in your Bible, you see it up here on the screen. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. The whole chapter talks about this subject, but it specifically points in the pre prior verses to these events in Numbers. And it says, guess what? All these things happen to them as examples to us. Man, I like that better than all these things happen to me as an example to them. I I'm really glad I got to learn the easy way. It says they were written for our admonition. That means warning. They were a warning label on our life because the end of the ages has come upon us. We're getting toward the end of this whole story. And God is saying, you know, I, I painted some stuff early on and I'm painting a big picture here, but you guys are living in some tough times and guess what? You're going to have to deal with some stuff, maybe even that they didn't. But you're going to go in it in a different way because you learn from their bad example. You learn from their bad example. It's kind of like this. My dad's a financial advisor. Now, I'm not saying my dad's a bad example. He's a good example. But here's the thing. Years ago, I was visiting him at his office, and he took me on the little tour. You know, he's showing me around. It was the first time I'd been there. And we came to a big corner office there. Really nice. I mean, the, you know, the real furniture, not, not veneer. I mean, we're talking the, the heavy stuff and that kind of thing. So, you know, several screens, just best of everything. And I said, wow, Dad, this guy must be really good. My dad looked at me. He said, no, he's terrible. Guess is wrong every single time. He's never made a good choice since he got here. 
When he says the stock is going up, man, it tanks the next day. When he says a stock is, is going to fail, you know, it shoots straight up and never looks back. I said, wow, Dad, why has he got such a nice office? Is he related to the boss or something? No? Well, then why don't you fire him? He said, fire him? We wouldn't fire him. He's our best employee. He's our most valuable employee. See, a guy who's always wrong 100% of the time is just as valuable in our business as a guy who's right 100% of the time. You just do the opposite. Everything that he says, you do the opposite. I can't find a guy who's right all the time, but I found a guy who's wrong all the time. He's just as valuable. Now, that's what we're seeing here so often in Scripture. We say, man, these Israelites, man, they're so messed up. Ah, thank you, Lord, for providing such a terrible example such a good bad example and so what can we do we can do the exact opposite what is it it's so simple let's believe god and receive the blessings that he's promised his best and his rest that's what he wants for us again goes back to that simple verse that we've made such a part of our heart here john 10:10. 10, 10. i have come that you might have life and that life abundantly. Is that a problem-free life? No, I told you the promised land had plenty of problems. But they faced them with God and they faced them with hope and love and joy and all the things that God wanted for them with honey on their hands and milk on their mouth. And you see them saying, yeah, this is everything that God wanted for my life. I have no regrets. But it's so important we always emphasize this at times too. There's another part to that verse, the first part of the verse. We don't hang it on our wall because it's kind of discouraging. But, you know, it says that the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. There's such a contrast between what God wants to do in your life and what the thief wants to do. And some of you know exactly what it is to have the thief rip off everything you hold most dear. The unbelief, the thief that is in that. And like most thieves, unbelief never works alone. <laughs> you know, rarely is it a one-man job. No, you really see lots of partners in crime. And we saw them here tonight. Fear and pessimism and criticism and self-sufficiency and pride and presumption and all of those things. It's quite a gang there. But I believe that unbelief is really the ringleader, the chief thief, if you will. Now, you might ask why, and I'll tell you. It's because... If you think of it this way, unbelief is the only ultimately unforgivable sin. Unbelief, a persistent unbelief and rejection of Jesus is the only sin that can keep people out of heaven. There will be lots of sinners in heaven. As a matter of fact, everyone in heaven will be a sinner, a former sinner, a forgiven sinner. But you know what? There will not be any unbelievers in heaven. Now, We've seen tonight that even believers can sometimes act like unbelievers. That's why I love that prayer in the New Testament where a man stands before Jesus and says, I do believe. Help me with my unbelief. That's a good one to know. It's a simple prayer. Lord, I do believe. You know that, but I still got a little unbeliever left in me. You know what I mean? And so help me with that unbelief. Get it out of me. Don't let it keep me out of Canaan. But see, unbelief is the only sin that could keep you out of heaven because it's faith it's belief in Christ that saves us. And so spiritually speaking, you're in one of the three places that we talked about tonight. We talked a lot about the wilderness. We talked about Canaan, but I only made passing reference to Egypt. But I want to spend a moment talking to anyone here in this room who might realize as we talk about this, you know what? I'm not just wandering in the wilderness. I'm still in the emptiness of Egypt. I never even left the place. I never even made that decision in the first place to believe in Christ. I don't have a relationship with God. And you know what? Every honest Christian will say, yeah, there's times in my life where there is maybe a faith failure or a lack of belief in it. But you know what? Every person ought to be able to point to a point where they know that they know that they know that they came to Christ in faith, in belief. And even during those faith failures, you know that he will not fail you. And so clearly Canaan's way better than the wilderness, but there is a place that is worse than the wilderness. And that's Egypt. Now, again, not the physical place. Don't miss the metaphor there that God wants us to understand. Remember, Egypt's a picture of sin. It's a picture of slavery. It's a picture of the cruel master of Satan over your life. A life without God and without a future and without a hope. Not only hell on earth, but hell after earth. And if you've never given your heart or life to Christ, the bottom line is you're still in Egypt. And if you have that realization today, the great news is that the solution 
is belief. Just putting your faith in Christ. That's simple. That's simple. And the rest of the walk of faith, well, he'll be with you for those steps too. But it starts with that step of just putting your faith in him here tonight. And I love it because Moses said, hey, God, show me your glory. And what was God's answer? Hey, the perfect balance of justice. Don't forget that. Justice, I am holy, but also mercy. Massive mercy. And you know what? That intersection, where is it? It's right there at the cross. The intersection of God's justice and God's mercy. How so? Well, you see that Jesus paid the price that sin requires. Sin does require justice, judgment. But Jesus took that price and paid it himself. The wages of sin, death. But he took my death and gave me the promised life. That's what happened there on the cross. And so forgiven sin has consequences. I mentioned that. But you know what? Unforgiven sin has much worse consequences. It has the worst possible consequences. Eternal separation from God. And God, that's not God's will for any person. Unbelief can keep you out of Canaan, but the biggest ripoff of all eternity is to stay in Egypt when God is bidding you out of Egypt tonight. Now, you might be saying, how do I do that? How do I do it? Well, again, there's no coincidence here that even in the paint picture that God painted, you know, one of the names, Joshua, you might recognize the Greek form of that name, Jesus. Jesus. That's the name that brings a person all the way to the fullness of all that God would want for their life. And that's what he wants to do in your life here tonight. And so in a moment, we're going to close our eyes. We're going to spend a moment in prayer. And during that time, I just want you to consider tonight, I'm going to give you at the end of that an opportunity to receive Jesus into your life. And by raising your hand here at that moment, at that time, what you're saying is, hey, I want out of Egypt. I'm saying yes to Jesus. I'm saying yes to Joshua. I'm saying, hey, take me into the promised land. And hey, if it even means I'm wandering in the wilderness, that's better than being the prince of Egypt and paying that price for all eternity. And you know what? It's not just saying yes to Jesus. This is what's great. In the process, you're also saying no. No to the thief of unbelief. He's not going to rip me off any longer. He's not going to rip my family and my loved ones off any longer when they see that my life is changing. And I'm not going to just try to pry my way into the promised land. I'm going to do it the only way you really can get to all of the things that God gives, which is by His grace, by receiving, by believing. So let's go ahead and close our eyes. Let's pray here tonight. And if you're a believer here tonight, pray for those who maybe aren't, because we see the power of prayer even in this chapter. Father, we ask according to your word and according to your will, we know that you are not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And Lord, I pray if there's any here tonight that realize that maybe their friends or maybe their family are on this journey, but Lord, they've never even started. They're never really off the starting block. And Lord, I pray that tonight would be that point in the process where you would bring them to that moment of realization that says, hey, I believe. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he rose again for me. And I want to follow him. I want to follow you, Lord, all the days of my life. And Lord, it's, it's free to us because it was costly to you. And so God, I pray that if there's anyone here tonight that does not know that they know that they know you and that they're headed to heaven, that they would make that bold step, that believing step, even here tonight. With our heads still bowed and our eyes still closed, if there's anyone here tonight, I'm just going to give an opportunity quickly for you to raise your hand and acknowledge your need to say, hey, I want, I want to say no to the thief of unbelief. I want to say yes to Jesus. Anyone here tonight who wants to make that decision? If you do, get it where I can see it because my eyes are failing. Anybody? Anybody here tonight? Maybe somebody watching through the internet as we broadcast these services. If there's anyone who wants to make that decision, I'd invite you to do it too. I see you over here in the first rows. Anybody else? Anybody else want to make that decision? Pray that prayer tonight that can change the course of your life here on earth and life into all eternity. Anybody sitting at that fork in the road, the faith fork, don't let fear keep you back. Don't let, what will people think? What will they think? They'll think you made the best decision you've ever made. Your real friends would call you forward into it. Anybody else here tonight? For you, raise your hand. I'd just ask you to pray along as I give these words. They are words that reflect the heart that God has 
for you and the heart that you would have toward God as you turn to him. God, I open my heart and I invite you inside to be my Lord, to be my friend, to be my guide, to be my Savior. I ask that you would forgive me of my sin, Lord, and I want to make different choices, Lord, and I pray that you would help me to walk through even the consequences, Lord, that might face me tomorrow and in the days to come with faith, not with fear. And God, I ask that you would allow me the grace to follow you every day of my life from this point forward and even to let others look on and follow in my footsteps as I follow you. God, I thank you for the promises that you've given me. I thank you for eternal life in Jesus' name.